Okay, let's uh, get started. Um, just, uh, uh, just to get us oriented where we are and where we're going. Um, we are working our way through the second of six themes on evolutionary robotics. We looked last time in lecture seven at the first two experiments in evolutionary robotics, both of which took place uh, in Europe. We looked at the small Kepra robot, arguably the first evolutionary robotics experiment started uh, with a physical robot. And then uh, we looked at, we ended last time with the gantry robot, this strange contraption made up of these two trolleys and this inverted uh, periscope. And at the very end of lecture on Tuesday, we saw how the gantry robot was able to learn the difference between triangles and rectangles. Maybe not the most sophisticated behavioral competency you can imagine, but not bad. How did the gantry robot distinguish between triangles and rectangles? And while you're thinking about that question, just remember this is a laptop and smartphone free zone for the next 75 minutes. Yes. That's right. The background was bright, that's right. Yep. That's right. It doesn't really matter whether it was light background or dark right. foreground, but something went dark and then something else went dark. Yes. And there's the recurrent synapses. That's correct. Exactly, right? So it needs to detect the time interval between this one going dark, this part of its visual field going dark, and then this part of its visual field going dark. And that's what recurrent connections give us, right? So it's distinguishing between these two objects using three different things. First of all, action, right? It's rotating that dental mirror and seeing either the rectangle or the triangle enter the left side of its visual field. So action is an important part of it. Perception is an important part. It sees one, one of its uh, visual fields going dark and then another, uh, or one of those circles going dark and the other circle going dark. And perception, action, and then memory or state, right? It needs to remember what happened a few time steps back. That is very different from a non-embodied system, right? So a non-embodied system, we would give it a million photographs of triangles and a million photographs of rectangles and tell it, these are triangles, these are rectangles, and it would learn within those images combinations of pixel values that indicate triangles and rectangles. So you can train a neural network, a disembodied neural network, to recognize, to tell the difference between triangles and rectangles. And the gantry robot, which is an embodied system, a robot that can move itself, or at least move the periscope, can also distinguish between triangles and rectangles. But they understand those differences differently, right? What about you? What is a triangle or rectangle to you? I'd say it's more like the uh, non-embodied system. Okay. You've seen a whole bunch of, okay, you know, what we recognize as triangles, and you still doesn't have time to see it as a slightly different triangle, but you know what time the triangle is, so you tell it to the left. That's right. So if you ask people this question, you can ask your friends this question who aren't taking this class, they'll usually give you an explanation like, we do it much more like a neural network, right? You've seen a gazillion triangles and a gazillion rectangles in your life by now. You do it like a, a deep learner, right? Not like the gantry robot, obviously. How does a baby do it? I don't know. Um, well, we also understand more about what those shapes, we can like handle them, we, like pizza is a triangle. Pizza is a triangle. We know, how, we know how that works. So like there's, there's also the, the physical embodiment of handling the object that the, 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 the distinguishes it for us too. That's a great example. We're going to see that in lecture uh, 10, active categorical perception. I can actively reach out in the world and grab things that feel triangle-like or rectangle-like. Um, so I don't know. We also, I mean, this is where I have like a mathematical concept of it as well. You know, three lines, three intersections. That's it, right? The way you were taught what a triangle was in school, right? It has these three lines and these three interior, interior angles. And, that's what a triangle is, right? I've seen lots of them more like the former non-embodied case than the non-embodied case, right? That's what it, 
feels like. But remember, thinking about thinking is misleading. So at, in our visual system, every tenth of a second, your eyes saccade or jump from one part of your visual field to the next, right? So most of the time, up here in the front, it feels like there's a professor and, and some slides and a blackboard and so on. But what you're really seeing is actually much more like what the gantry robot sees. You might see my mouth moving. You might look at my pupils. You might look at a very small part of the slide. And the particular feature in your visual field that you're looking at changes every 10th of a second, right? Most of the time you're not aware of it, but if you pay attention to yourself looking at the world, you will sense that your eyes are moving every tenth of a second. So what a triangle really is, from your visual system's point of view, and there is a motor system that is moving your eyes, so you perceive a very small part of your visual field, and then your brain decides how to move and foveate or focus foveate on some other small part of your visual field. A triangle is you see something that looks like this. Your eye might catch the, the very corner of a triangle, or possibly this could be a parallelogram. You don't know yet. So your brain makes a theory about what it's looking at and will decide to jump to another part of the visual field. And if you're brain causes your eyes to saccade up here, and now you see something that looks like this, your brain might start to say, I think I'm seeing a triangle. I haven't seen all of it yet, but I'm going to jump down here. Up, oh, there's another corner here. Let me make sure. Go back. Yeah, I saw that before. I remember seeing that three-tenths of a second earlier. This, 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 this. Your eyes are actually moving and perceiving all the time. <coughs> So your perception of a triangle or a rectangle or any other object of interest in your world is probably much more like the gantry robot than the disembodied learner, but it feels like the former, right? You look at a triangle and you learned in school it has three sides and three interior angles. That's a triangle, right? A triangle is not see this, move here, see this, move here, see this, and so on. Okay, just to reinforce this difference between embodiment and non-embodiment. Okay, so that was uh, some of the first experiments in evolutionary robotics. Before we jump into lecture eight today, any questions about the assignments? <coughs> Undergraduates, you're working on assignment four, grads seven and eight, all good? Okay, so we're now gonna move into this sub-theme and we're gonna look at three lectures in the sub-theme on minimal cognition. If you remember back to our history of AI, the, the early approaches to trying to make intelligent machines was, let's take a disembodied machine, a big computer, and give it the maximally cognitive tasks we can think of. They started with tic-tac-toe, then checkers, then chess, and just last year, go. These are the most difficult tasks for, or most difficult tasks for most humans to achieve, right? Let's start with something that's really hard for us and get a disembodied machine to do them. And Go took a little bit longer than chess, but we've now got machines to do that. So that turns out to actually be easy. But robots that can come in here after class and clean up all the garbage and put it in the trash, that task, which to us does not seem as difficult as chess or Go, that one we haven't solved yet. Thinking about thinking is misleading. Right? So we're going to, in the next three lectures, come at intelligent behavior from the opposite direction. We're going to start with the simplest possible robot, neural network, and tasks we can think of. Hopefully get them to do that, but they're going to do it using the three components we just talked about. All of the agents and robots you're going to see in 8, 9, and 10, perceive, act, and remember. And they made, those three things may be pretty rudimentary, but they combine those three things to perform behaviors which someone might point at and say, that's the beginning of cognitive behavior. That's what minimal cognition is. Instead of taking a big computer and trying to teach it Go, let's take a simple creature that can move around in its environment, get it to do something minimally cognitive. Once we figure out how to get it to do that, we can hopefully scale it up to more interesting tasks here in the real world. Okay. In order to do that, we're going to start, first of all, with a particular kind of neural network, which is inside these minimally cognitive agents. 
And uh, these neural networks, a bit of a mouthful here, continuous time recurrent neural networks, or CTRNNs. We're going to look at those uh, today and then move on to minimally cognitive agents that have these CTRNNs. Arguably, these CTRNNs are not minimal. The neural networks that we talked about in lecture five, synapses, connect, uh, neurons connected by synapses to other mm -hmm. neurons, that's probably the simplest neural network. CTRNNs are one step up from that. So in order to build up an understanding of CTRNN, my apologies, we're going to have to do a little bit of calculus. It's a little bit early in the morning to do some calculus, but I promise you we're not going to do too much today. Just as a reminder, uh, where does calculus come from? We have some variable x uh, and a variable y, and there seems to be some relationship between these two variables. We'd like to describe it. One good way to describe the relationship between x and y is that as x increases, <coughs> as we move from left to right, how does y change, right? Delta x and delta y. For our purposes today, we're going to use this to, to start to think about how the values of neurons change over time as our agents run around in their little environments. So for now, think about x as time. I should have probably used t. So as time goes on from left to right in our little cartoon here, how does y change, where y is going to be the value of a neuron at a given point in time? So in y equals x up there in the line, as time goes on, the value of the neuron, y, goes up over time, right? Pretty simple. Most of the time, we're doing this in discrete steps. So the new value uh, of x is equal to the old value. And again, I'm sorry, there, this should probably be y uh, equals y plus 1. So as we're moving, we can do this using a difference equation, which is the discrete form of a differential equation. Works fine, but we would often like to know how y changes as a function of x at very, very small time steps. And ultimately, we'd like to know how it changes continually in time. That's where the continuous time in CTRNNs comes in. So we're going to use calculus in a moment to describe how the values of neurons in a CTRNN are changing smoothly over time, not just from one discrete time step to the next. So far, so good? OK, so where did calculus come from? Uh, we can describe this up here, the slope just fine. But as we want to describe it for smaller and smaller increments, and ultimately we want to know the slope at a given point in time, this doesn't really make sense anymore. So we had to invent this notation, which says how x changes as a function of t. And on the next slide, we're going to switch to dy over dt. So how does the value of the neuron change as a function of time? And we're going to then just write this as uh, x prime or y prime on the next slide. And in this case, regardless of the amount of time that we move forward, the variable of interest changes by the same amount. Right? x prime equals 1. The slope of this line at, every, at any given point on this line is 1. Okay, so the rate of change of the value of the neuron is equal to the rate of change of t. That's what x prime equals 1 means, right? Everybody remember this? Not so hard. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to, uh, and actually let me just make a point about the red box here. We're going to start to build up an equation in this part of the box. So I'm going to start adding terms to this as we go from one slide to the next. So as you're filling in this box, I suggest you put the terms where they are in their horizontal position so you'll have room to place the other terms as we go. OK, disregard this for a moment. Let's pay attention to the one up top. We're actually going to have a set of ordinary differential equations. And here I've written it as difference equations. But we're going to have a set of differential equations which are going to describe how each neuron in the robot's brain changes over time. Each neuron may change differently, so we're going to need a different differential equation for each neuron. <coughs> if we have 10 neurons in the robot's brain, we're going to have 10 ODEs. If we have 20 neurons, we're going to have 20 ODEs, and so on. We're going to develop over here in the box an ODE for a given neuron, which is the I neuron. Okay, so how do we write this? 
Y prime sub I means the rate of change over time of the ith neuron is equal to whatever we put on the right-hand side. Okay. Let's assume for today that neurons can range between minus 1 and plus 1. So we're going to squash them as usual. Assuming they change between plus 1 and minus 1, the first term that we put on the right-hand side is the rate of change of the ith neuron is equal to the value of the ith neuron. We don't have a prime symbol here. So this seems a little bit strange already. Why this term? What does this term do? Let's assume we have time on the horizontal axis here. We have minus 1 and plus 1 for the value of the y of the ith neuron. Why y prime equals minus y? Any ideas? Let's, one way to start to understand ordinary differential equations is to set an initial condition and then in your head try and integrate it, which is easy when we have easy ODEs. It'll be a little bit harder as we go on, but we can at least start by saying, let's imagine that we place our robot in the world um, and it has a bunch of neurons inside its head. One of those neurons, we start by setting the value to plus one. So maybe it's a touch sensor neuron, and that foot is in contact with the ground, and it sets the sensor neuron to plus one. We're going to describe how that neuron changes as we start to go forward in time. So the rate of change of that neuron is dictated by this ODE. What's going to happen at the next time step? Let's forget the incoming touch information for a moment. Let's just assume that the value of this neuron at the first time step is plus 1. What starts to happen? Well, if you say negative y, then it's going to switch because it can't get any like, more. If it's at an angle, it can't go any more than that, so it's going to try and go the opposite direction. It's going to go in the opposite direction. That's what the negative sign means. And remember, we're dealing with continuous time. This is not a difference equation. So it doesn't mean we're going to subtract 1 from this value at the next time step. All it means is the rate of change is equal to minus 1. So it's going to start to move in that direction. So at a short period of time later, and we're not going to specify it, just a small amount of time, the neuron's value has started to decrease. Okay, so now the value is 0.9. What's going to happen at the next time step? If we keep integrating this ordinary differential equation, what's the new value? Decrease, but not as fast. It's going to decrease, but not as fast. At this point in time, the value is uh, 0.9, so y prime equals minus 0.9. The rate of decrease is minus 0.9, so the rate of decrease is decreasing. What happens as we continue integrating this equation all the way out? What's the shape of the curve that this ODE is going to describe? <clears throat> you can just draw it in the air. What is it going to look like? Right? It's going to decrease, decrease, decrease. And as you learned in Calculus 101, if there's an asymptote somewhere, it will never actually decay to zero, but it will approach it arbitrarily close. Right? Okay, let's pick our robot up, either our physical robot or our simulated robot, put it back at the origin, uh, zero out all the values, and set the new initial value of a neuron in the robot's head to minus one. What's going to happen now? What's the shape of this curve? How is the value of this neuron going to change over time? Right? So it's going to increase. So at this point, y equals minus 1. So the rate of change of y is minus minus 1, which is plus 1. So it's going to increase pretty quickly. But now the rate of increase is also going to approach 0. Our, neuron initial, our neurons are going to take on values between 1 and minus 1. doesn't matter what initial condition we set it will basically decay back to 1. So one of the nice first things about c turn ends is we don't have to set some actual <coughs> absolute cap to say if you're above or below minus 1, squash you back. It'll just decay towards it uh, after. Uh, anyways. 
The other reason for including this minus yi comes from the actual physiology of neural uh, networks, of a nerve, uh, biological nervous systems. So your own neurons have this same property. They're lazy. If they're stimulated from outside by another neuron or by a touch sensor, they will fire, but then left to their own devices, because they're lazy, they will gradually decay back to some resting value. <clears throat> And in our mathematical model here, the resting value for now is zero. So far, so good. So what we're actually going to be doing is we develop this CTRNN. You're going to, we're going to end up with a mathematical model of a brain, which is much more realistic than the simpler case we saw in lecture five. OK. So let's keep marching forward and develop this equation. The next variable we're going to introduce is, is tau sub i. And I apologize, the font here didn't let me do a proper tau, but that's not t, ta, it's tau. So tau sub i, and the sub i should remind you that that variable, or the value of this variable, is specific to the ith neuron. Remember, we're going to have a whole bunch of these ODEs. So every neuron is going to have its own time constant, its own tau. This might be something you haven't seen before, which is we're putting the variable on the left side. So if you're not comfortable with that, you can mentally divide both sides by tau sub i. So you end up with the rate of change of the ith neuron is equal to minus y sub i divided by tau sub i. Sound good? For most people, it's easier to think about tau on the right-hand side in the denominator. OK. What does the time constant do? How does it change the behavior of the neuron here? Let's simplify things a little bit. Let's assume that tau sub i is always a positive value. It's always above 0. Let's erase the behavior of our previous neuron. We're making this neuron a little more sophisticated now. How does tau influence the behavior that we just looked at? It's going to change the rate of change at each time step by some constant. So if it's greater than 0, it's going to make it decay slower. And if it's less than 0, it's going to increase the rate of decay. That's it. So it's, going to, it's obviously going to change the rate of decay, or it's going to change the rate of change, because y prime is the rate of change. So we introduce a variable. It's going to change the rate of change. But how it's going to change it, again, a good way to do that is to set an initial condition. So let's set plus 1, and then think about, as you were just mentioning, different values for tau sub i. So let's start with a very large value. Let's imagine tau is equal to a million. I said it's any positive value, so it doesn't really matter. If the initial value of the neuron is plus 1 and tau is a million, how does the value of this neuron change over time? What does the curve look like now? What's that? It doesn't change much. It doesn't change a whole lot, right? So before it was dropping like this. Now we're dividing by a very large number. We're dividing by a million. So the right-hand side is always going to be pretty close to 0, right? Divide by a large number. So the rate of change is close to 0, which literally means this isn't going to change very much. It's going to take a long, long time to approach the asymptote. So a neuron that has a very large time constant is an Eeyore neuron. Anybody remember Eeyore from the Winnie the Pooh series? Very phlegmatic. Takes a long time to get Eeyore to start doing something. Same thing here. You can push all you want on a neuron with a very large time constant, and it ain't going to change very much. Right? OK, same thing down here. Minus 1, if we still have a very large tau value, it is also going to take a long time to respond to <coughs> this initial value. All right, let's look at the same two set of initial conditions. But now let's make tau very, very, very small. Let's say tau is equal to 10 to the minus 9. Doesn't really matter. Some value very close to 0. What's going to happen now? It's going to change really quickly. So it's going to approach the asymptote very quickly. So this is the Woody Allen neuron. 
any slight stimulation and it's all over the place. It's very, very reactive. It's extremely sensitive to any little perturbation. So good little mnemonic to remember tau. Large tau, Eeyore, small tau, Woody Allen. Pick your metaphor, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Okay, so far so good? All right, let's keep going. We're gonna introduce uh, some more terms here and these should be more familiar to you. Right? So the influence of a given neuron I, it's influenced not just in a CTRNN by its own <coughs> value, but it also is influenced by other neurons, which we're now going to subscript with J. So we're going to take the I of neuron, which we're going to consider as the postsynaptic neuron, it's the target, and we're going to look at all the presynaptic neurons that attach to the I of neuron. And assume for our purposes here that there are uppercase N presynaptic neurons that attach to neuron I. Right? We're going to sum over all of those presynaptic neurons. We're going to take the current value of that neuron, the Jf neuron that connects to the If neuron, multiply it by the weight of the synapse uh, that connects neuron J to neuron I. Should look pretty familiar, right? Okay, so let's disregard tau for a moment and minus y and just think about uh, w times y here. We're going to do that raw weighted sum. Let's assume that entire sum is positive. What's going to happen to this value? The rate of change is going to be greater. I just told you the value can't go above plus 1, but for the moment, let's just imagine it can. So if that whole raw sum is plus, is more than 0, it means if we just if we disregard this and disregard this, this whole thing is positive, which means the rate of change is positive, which means the neuron is going to try and increase in value. Right? The amount that it's going to try and increase is dictated by these. If this raw sum is negative, then that raw sum is trying to pull the value of the if neuron down, right? Okay. So again, there are now interactions between these different terms. So the current value of the neuron might be positive. So its own value is trying to decay back down to zero. So it may be trying to decrease. So if the current value is plus one, y sub i equals plus one, so we have equals minus one, trying to go down, plus maybe a positive sum. So the other neurons are saying, no, 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 we want you to increase. They may cancel out. You do the, you do the math and work it out. And you get a final single value on the right-hand side of this equation, and that says how the rate of change of that neuron is going to go. So far, so good? OK, let's keep going. Now we're introducing the activation function, which you've seen before. Remember, the activation function is squishing neuron values to some desired range. In CTRNNs, we're going to use the TANH function, um, which you can look up afterward. But you might remember that TANH will take whatever is inside and squash it to a value between plus 1 and minus 1. So this is a little bit different from what you've seen before. Before, we were putting the activation function outside the raw sum. Now we're putting it on the inside. Why would we do that? The reason we're going to do that is because we are going to allow y sub i itself to range above plus 1 and minus 0.1. So we're going to assume the good way to think about this is the neurons in a CTRNN inside the neuron they have their own value, whatever, whatever we compute when we integrate this ODE. So they have their own internal private value. But when they send that value outward and look at our presynaptic neuron, y sub j, it might have, y sub j may be a value above 1 or minus 1. But we're going to squash that private value to an outgoing value that's between plus 1 and minus 1. So anytime we need to read out the value of a neuron in a CTRNN, the first thing that happens is it gets squished by this activation function before it goes out. So the output value of a neuron, 
in a CTRNN is always going to be between plus one and minus one. Its internal value, the, this actual value here, doesn't matter. We're not going to try and clamp it to any range. <clears throat> Just makes the math a little bit easier here. So far, so good? Okay, let's keep going. We're going to introduce another term, the gain of a neuron. And again, we have uh, G sub J because we're going to use it for these over here. But this, the subscript here is just a reminder that for all of the 20 neurons you have, the, neuron, the robot has inside its brain, each neuron has its own gain value. Okay, so this we haven't seen before. Why include a gain? The gain, again, doesn't really matter what this value is. It can be negative, it can be positive. Why include a gain value? What does it do? It's going to scale our uh, yj values before it gets pushed down in our, in, our in our activation function here. That's right. So the gain is going to turn up, this is a term from engineering, it's going to turn up the gain or the volume, if you like, of the j of neurons. So let's imagine we have 20 neurons. 19 of them have a gain that's near zero. That means they're all kind of whispering. They're all, those, are, those neurons are all very quiet. Even if we have a large weight that connects uh, a J of neuron to an I of neuron, if that J of neuron has a gain near zero, it's quiet. If the 20th neuron has a, a very large gain value, then it's yelling, it's always loud, and it has generally a large influence on the other 19 neurons. Now, we could make the volume, if you like, of a given neuron loud by making all of its outgoing synapses have large W values, right? We could increase the influence of a uh, of a neuron on all its postsynaptic neurons by basically just making all those weights large. But what you're going to see when we look at an experiment that uses these CTRNNs in a moment is that we're going to place tau, the taus, the w's, and the g's under evolutionary control. Up till now, most of what we've seen is just evolving the weights. We're going to broaden the influence of evolution, we're going to allow it to play with the tau's, the, the w's, and the g's. So if evolution, for some reason, wanted to make a given neuron have more influence on the other neurons, it could do so through mutation by turning up this weight, and this weight, and this weight, and this weight, but it's going to take evolution a lot of mutations to do so. So by adding a gain value with a single mutation, that increases G, evolution in one stroke is going to turn up the volume or the influence of a given neuron. We're just trying to make things a little bit easier on evolution. Let's assume that in a given CTRNN, evolution mutates that CTRNN and sets the G value for one of the neurons to zero. What has evolution done? basically said that that neuron is not important, it's going to suppress it. It suppress it, right? So be quiet. That particular neuron is basically shut off. Regardless of the actual value of that neuron, any value times a g of zero, it's turned off. So evolution, we remember uh, when we talked about neural networks, it's very difficult to decide how many neurons to let evolution play with. So we could possibly give evolution a large number of neurons, and if it doesn't need any, it can turn down the volume to zero of some of these neurons. So indirectly, evolution can kind of change the number of neurons in play in any given neural network by playing around with the Gs. Okay. We're going to introduce now bias of neuron J. Again, theta sub J reminds us that each neuron has its own theta value. And it's going in the inner part of this equation here. So the first thing we do when we start to compute this raw sum, we visit a presynaptic neuron and we add its theta to its internal value. <clears throat> Why introduce this bias term? What does that do? 
Let's assume also that bias values can be negative or positive. What does bias do? Possibly. So the gain is the gain is making is sort of tuning the magnitude of the influence of y. But bias is slightly different. What is the bias doing? Changing the threshold. Uh, it's not the threshold. Well, it's going to change whether or not you get what what sort of value you get out of tan h. Whether you're going to get one. It's a, you know, it's going to bound it between let's say zero and one or something like that instead of negative one. That's it. So it's going to influence what we pull out of the tan H, out of the activation function. So if theta is plus 1, then whatever this computation is, the value is always higher, right? So we're kind of setting a constant value for a neuron, right? It's always, if the, if the theta is positive, then most of the time the tan H function is going to be above 0 as well, right? That neuron is kind of always on. And it's going to fluctuate around its default value. Actually, let's, let's draw this out here. So we have on the vertical axis, remember, the current value of, I'll change this to y sub j for us. We have the actual value of y sub j at the moment, whatever that happens to be. And then it's changed by the bias value. So let's say bias is positive, no matter what, the value of y sub j is we're always adding theta to it. So in essence, we're biasing some neurons to be positive, or if a given neuron's theta is, a given value's theta is less than zero, we subtract theta, and its value tends to always be negative. So there's sort of, we're kind of, through bias, the bias values, we're setting the default value of a neuron. Okay. So evolution is also going to be able to play with the thetas, and by setting the, the bias of some neurons to be positive, evolution is saying, I want those to usually have a positive influence, be trying to pull things up. When we take the tan h of, of the value of that neuron, it <clears> tends <throat> to be positive, or evolution is, says, this neuron is generally going to be inhibitory. It's generally going to be having a negative influence on y sub i. Okay, just remember um, that this whole thing here is now the output value of the neuron. It has its internal raw value, y sub j, but when we read something out of that neuron, we pass it through this whole thing and we get back a value that's between plus 1 and minus 1. So far, so good? OK. Final term um, is, and this is bad nomenclature here, but we have an uppercase i sub i, uppercase i for input. So we're going to have, remember, we're going to have a whole bunch of these neurons. And some of these neurons are going to be connected to sensors. right? So if you've got to the neurons part, of assignment four, you've already seen these sensor neurons. So some neurons are receiving a value directly from an input sensor. And that's represented here by this term. So let's imagine we have a given neuron in our robot. And there is a touch sensor attached to that neuron. And the, and the touch sensor suddenly fires. The robot's leg comes into contact with the ground. So for that neuron, i sub i suddenly goes to 1. How does that influence the behavior of y sub i? It's being influenced by all these other things as well. But this term over here just got set to plus 1 because the touch sensor fired. What happens to the rate of change of that neuron? It's not a bound. We, we have y prime equals all this stuff and then plus 1. So it's just saying the rate of increase is going to try and increase, right? The, the value of that neuron is going to start to climb. Imagine that tau sub i for the moment. Let's simplify our lives a little bit here. Imagine tau sub i is 1 for the moment. So tau disappears. We can forget about it. Imagine that the current value of y sub i 
is zero. So that's zero. Imagine all of these w's are zero. So everything disappears except y prime equals i sub i. So if i sub i is one, we have y prime equals one. The rate of change of the ith neuron is plus one. So that touch sensor, which is firing with a value of plus one, is going to cause that neuron to start to increase in value away from its current value, which is zero. Question? Okay, so if this you don't want it to touch zero, so is that why you just you don't want it to? Um, so you don't you don't want it to, to ever be zero? Is that why you're adding the i? I'm we're we're just adding the i to allow the sensor neuron the sensors to influence the rates of change of the neurons. Some, some neurons, remember we have a whole bunch of these ODEs. If we have 20 neurons, we have 20 ODEs. Some of those neurons are going to be hidden neurons, and we're going to set that beforehand. For those neurons, which are hidden neurons, this term doesn't exist. It's just not there. There is another set of neurons among those 20, which we're going to say, you're the sensor neurons. If we have a robot that has eight sensors in it, we might take eight of the 20 neurons and say, OK, you guys are sensor neurons. And for those eight ODEs, it's going to include this term. And as we, as we simulate our robot, whatever, those eight, whatever the values of those eight sensors are, we take the value of the first neuron, of the value of the first sensor, plug it into this term here, go to the second ODE, take the value of the second sensor, plug it into here, and keep going. So eight of those 20 neurons are being influenced by themselves and all the other neurons. They're also being influenced by a sensor value, one of the eight sensor sensors that are in the robot. So far, so good? So if you visualize this, we've got 20 ODEs that look like this. Eight of them have the I term on the end. The other 12 do not. That's the difference between a sensor neuron and all the other sensors in a CTRNM. Yes? So the eye is taking care of the problem that the input layer neurons don't have any neurons on the layer before them. So it's like the input layer neurons don't have the summation. The summation is zero, and the eye takes the place of that. That's, so that's, that's correct. That's a, that's a good way to think about it, right? So we have sensors. We have sensor neurons, and we have the other kinds of neurons. In CTRNMs, we're trying to simplify this mathematically by just saying, forget about sensor neurons, hidden neurons, and motor neurons. We just have all the neurons. And once we have all the neurons, then we're going to go back and say, OK, how many sensors do we have? We have k <coughs> sensors. So we're going to assign one sensor to one neuron. Right? So this is kind of like the input layer, but now we don't really have an input layer. We just have all neurons connected to all other neurons, but some of these neurons are receiving a sensor value. They're connected to a sensor, and they're connected. That's what this term indicates. They're connected. So if uh, lowercase i equals zero, that means we're talking about the ith or the zeroth neuron, the first one. And that one may, re may receive an input from a sensor, the zero with sensor. So we're going to take the first sensor connected to the first neuron, second sensor, second neuron, eighth sensor, eighth sensor, eighth neuron. We don't have any more <coughs> sensors left, so the remaining 12 ODEs do not have an I term associated with them. So I'm sorry, I might not have made that clear before. There is no input layer, hidden layer, and output layer anymore. There's no layers. There are just 20 ODEs, and each one has associated with it a tau, a bunch of Ws, G, theta, and some of them have an I sub I. So it's like a, just a ball of neurons, and they're all connected to each other? Yeah, actually. This picture hopefully will help. That's what it looks like. It's just a whole bunch of spaghetti. <clears throat> we'll come back to the slide in a minute, but maybe this helps clarify things. Some of these represent this picture here, the sensory uh, feedback. So we have actually all of these neurons all connected. It's a huge uh, bowl of spaghetti. But 
One part of that interconnected mass is getting sensory feedback. So every circle in this dotted ellipse has an I sub I term tacked on the end. And these guys in the back here, they do not. But all of them are connected to everybody else. All right? Question? Um, the big arrows that are going in and out. Yes. Um, are those like representing sections like one node or just like the whole node? It represents that, yes. So the sensory feedback arrow here, that means that it's connected to all of the neurons inside that input-output unit thing, right? It doesn't specify in this picture how many sensors there are, but each sensor is connected to one and only one neuron inside that input-output unit mass. And is that typically evolved which... Uh, which sensor is connected to which neuron? That's usually set. We just set. Okay. We, we have eight sensors, and we say, all right, we're going to have 100 neurons. So the first eight neurons are connected to the eight sensors. Okay. Right? And then evolution takes it from there. So far, so good? Okay. So that's, the, so that's sensor neurons, ones that are receiving I sub I values. Then we have our hidden neurons, as usual, not in a layer, but they just don't have uh, input values. And then we have our motor neurons, right? So we've got to do the same thing. We have this mass of interconnected neurons, and let's say we have six motors. So we're going to pick six of the neurons. It doesn't really matter which ones we pick. We're going to pick those six and attach them to the six motors. So at every time step in the simulation, remember we need to actuate our motors. Our motors say, what should I do? We need to give each motor a number. If we have six motors, we need to give it six numbers, which could be desired angle, right? Or that number could be desired angular velocity of a wheel. Doesn't matter from the point of view of the neural network. The robot just says, hey, I need six numbers. And the neural network obliges by, again, we pick six of those neurons, doesn't really matter which ones, and we give it this whole value, right? Remember, we need to squash the value to between minus one and plus one. So six of the neurons in our bowl of spaghetti become motor neurons. Okay. In the experiment we're going to talk about in a moment, they did it this way. They had the, this huge bowl of spaghetti, and they had a subset here, which were sensor neurons. And inside this mass here, there were also some neurons which were tagged as motor neurons. Those were the ones that we're going to read out values from and send them to the motors. Sound good? OK. OK, so we're going to all of the experiments we're going to see in the next three lectures they all have this inside. We're going to see different robots. Some have two sensors and two motors. We have four ODEs and then maybe more if we have hidden neurons. They all have basically this form. So as we're evolving those robots, um, evolution is going to be playing with this vector. So if we have 20 neurons, we're going to have a vector of length 20, which represents the tau's for each of the 20 neurons. We're going to have this matrix, right? Because we're going to have 20 neurons, and each of those 20 neurons is going to have incoming connections from all the other neurons. So what is the size of this matrix W? We have 20 neurons, and they're all connected to each other. N it's n squared, right? We're going to have a 20 by 20 matrix where the element WJI in that matrix represents the weight of the synapse that connects neuron J to neuron I. So we're giving evolution a vector and a matrix, a second vector, which also has 20 numbers in it. Those are the 20 gains for the 20 neurons. A, a, a third vector, which is all the 20 thetas. And off we go. So the genome in these experiments. Remember the genome is the blueprint. It's the thing that contains all the things that evolution can change. That, that genome is a data structure that contains three vectors and one matrix. And evolution can change one or any of the things inside that genome. 
We're going to take that genome and we have to turn it into a phenotype, which is the robot. So we take a given genome, which is three vectors and one matrix, and we label all of the ODEs. We have all these ODEs for all these neurons. We take out all the tau's, all the w's, and put them into the ODEs and start integrating those ODEs. And when we integrate them, or the computer integrates them, we're going to start to see continuous change in the values of these neurons. For those of you that know a little bit about uh, ODEs and computers, the, obviously computers work in discrete time steps. So under the hood, the computer is going to fake it. We're not actually going to do calculus and give a, a perfectly smooth curve, but the computer will give you back something that looks more, like, more or less like a continuous curve, which is the changing values of each of the 20 neurons. Okay, we're not going to get into how the computer does that. Doesn't doesn't really. Matter. As you uh, do your homework for tonight, and you think about uh, this equation, a good way to again build up an intuition for it is to blank out some of the terms and think about how will that neuron behave if it has a low time constant or a high time constant. How will it behave if it has a low gain or a high gain, a low bias or a high bias, just like we, just as we just did. Okay, question. So is there any training? Do you adjust? Do, does this take feedback and adjust the weights? Absolutely. The training is evolution. It's okay. going to tune W, tune the tau vector, the bias vector, and the gain. But, but not within the neural network. It's only the, the evolutionary algorithm. Not within. There's no learning, right? There's not. There's no internal thing that's trying to figure out what the right Ws and Gs okay. are. It's just evolution, right? All we all evolution has is these three vectors and this one matrix and off it goes. Good? Okay, so to finish this lecture, it's a little bit shorter, we're going to look at an application of this. This is a pretty involved experiment, so for the undergraduates, if you don't take away every, everything from what I'm about to say, that's okay. This is mostly for the grad students, but I think it also helps ground what these CTRNNs are doing. Really interesting paper uh, a few years back from Yamashita and Tani, and they looked at um, what's known as motor sequencing. I won't write it out. Motor sequencing. This is another important building block of intelligence. So if, um, if we finish class here and one of you was very obliging, I might say, listen, I'm dying for a cup of coffee. Would you leave this building, go to the hospital, grab me a cup of coffee, here's some money, go grab me a coffee, grab yourself one, and bring it back? You're going to do motor sequencing. I don't need to tell you, lift your left leg and then your right leg, and if you repeat that 12 times, you'll get to the door. Or not, right? You know how to segment or put those simple motor primitives together. Get up, that's motor primitive one. Walk to the door, that's motor primitive two. Open the door, that's motor primitive three. You're, you're able to sequence a bunch of things together to, if you're obliging, uh, oblige me and go get myself and you a cup of coffee, right? the overall task. Very hard to get a robot to do that. So they looked at this here by taking this cute little humanoid robot. And I think if you put this into Google, you can go find the videos on YouTube and actually watch the robot do this. Um, it's got an upper body here and a little cube that's put in front of it. And it starts in this home position. And the investigators um, stimulate one of the neurons in the back with a goal. Okay, so the goal is just a single number, and they're stimulating one of those neurons in the back. So how do they stimulate a neuron? They just tack on another term to one of the ODEs, and that term captures the number coming from the investigators, the goal. So that number gets fed into one of the, neural, one of the neurons and starts to spread its influence to the other neurons. What does that number mean? It doesn't mean anything to the robot. The robot gets that number, which influences how the neurons change, which influences how the motors apply forces to the joints, and the robot starts to move. And the investigators say, you did a good job of doing what I wanted you to do, or not so good. Right? They give back a fitness value. Yes? Did you say they inject the, a value into the goal, and that spread to the rest of the neural network? Yes. So they have a goal. They have something they want the robot to do. So if you follow one of these paths from the left to the right, that is one possible goal. So the goal could be, hey, robot, let's follow the uppermost path here. Start at your home position. Reach for the object. Move the object up and down three times. 
and then return to the home position. That's the goal. The goal is to do those motor primitives in, in a row. I ask you to go get us a cup of coffee, and your goal becomes to go get us a cup of coffee, which requires a bunch of these things. How does the investigators tell the robot to do all that stuff? They just inject a single number, one number, which goes into one neuron, and it goes in there by tacking on this additional term to the ODE for that neuron. So the rate of change of that neuron differs depending on different numbers we put in there, different goals. So you can be sure, regardless of what the W's and all the rest of them are, is if we take one neural network, one set of biases, weights, and all the rest, we put one number into one ODE, and it's going to change what all the neurons do. They're all attached to everything else. If we take away the goal and put in a different, a different random number, a different number to the same neural network, it's going to do something different. So for this robot, when it's sitting there motionless and we put in this one number, it'll start doing something. Then we put it back to the home position. We put in a separate number, same neural network, and the robot does something different. Right? And we just measure how well did it do at what we asked it to do. Right? <clears throat> and we're going to just keep evolving sets of neural networks so that when we put in goal number one, the topmost curve, it goes. And when we put in a second number, it goes. That's it, right? So that robot would get a high fitness. The vast majority of them don't do that, right? And we're going to evolve neural networks to do all of these, however many goals there are here. That's the task. So far, so good? Yes? How did they know which, or did they just pick a random neuron to start simulating and then... doesn't matter. They picked, and it's the same across all the neural networks. They say, okay, neuron number 71. Mm -hmm. You're the goal. You're the goal neuron. Okay. So the 71st ODE has one additional term that captures that one number. And they evaluate each neural network six times. So I can't fig figure this out. Maybe there's six goals here. They're going to introduce six different numbers, and the robot is going to do six different things. And the investigators measure how close to the six desired things the robot did. The closer it is, the higher the fitness. Evolve, 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 until they get a neural network that if you put in any one of these six numbers, the robot does what it was supposed to do. It's an evolutionary robotics experiment. So far, so good? OK, I started by introducing this experiment by saying it's hard to get robots not only to do something, but to be able to do these motor primitives, one thing after the other. And we would like them to do it um, in a modular fashion. So we don't want it to memorize all of these different goals, and from the robot's point of view, they're all completely different. We would like the robot to realize that each of these six goals or these six behaviors we asked it to do, each one is made up of a sequence of motor primitives. And we want it to be able to not just learn to do what we want, but to segment out these little functions, these little motor primitives, and organize them in a functional hierarchy. Right? So some of these goals are made up of the same motor primitives. Three of the goals include, um, I'm sorry, I can't see that in this picture. It's not clear in this picture, but some of the goals have these same tasks in them, up and down three times, or left and right three times. So how can we get the robot to do that? The typical way that this is done in robotics is we're going to create a neural network that is not just a bowl of spaghetti, but it's broken into three separate bowls of spaghetti where there is not connections from one bowl to the other bowl. So in essence, the experimenters zero out some of these Ws. They cut a whole bunch of synapses between these three sets of neurons. So basically you have a robot that has three little brains inside. And each one of these brains are trained to produce one of these motor primitives. So one, one of these little brains here, represented by the green squiggle, might be lift the block up and down two times. 
A second brain or a second motor primitive might be shake the block back and forth uh, three times. The little up and down here, this is neuron activation, not the actual movement of the arms. And the third subbrain here might be something else. So it might be shake the block forward uh, slightly, backwards a lot, forward slightly, and backwards a lot. Okay. So we could teach the robot each of these little tasks and say, I want you to train each of your little brains to be able to produce each of those little, uh, each of those little motor primitives. And then when I give you a goal, do motor primitive one, then motor primitive three, then motor primitive two, there is some more neural machinery sitting on top that gates these three subbrains. You've actually seen this architecture already in this class. We saw a situation where there were simple connections between sensors and motors, and there was something on top that was gating or allowing each one of these circuits to grab hold of the motors and actually control the robot and then let go again. Where did we see this? This is all the way back to the beginning of the semester. Anybody have a Roomba at home? It's that, the, the neural network that I'm talking about is what's in your Roomba. It's the subsumption architecture. If you go back to lecture two, history of AI, that idea has been around uh, since the 90s. It's a nice idea, but it has an important limitation. What is it? You want to move the block diagonal, there's no, there's no component to do that, so that's not going to work. Actually, that's an important limitation, not the one I was trying to get at. How many motor primitives can you carry down? <laughs> Several, more than three, right? Hard to say what a motor primitive is for a competent adult human, but it's probably more than three, right? Hopefully. Um, you probably don't have a separate neural circuit inside your brain that says, I'm responsible for exiting Kalkin 04. That's the only <laughs> thing I know how to do. That's it. When you're in Kalkin 04 and you need to leave, I'm, I'm your neural circuit. I'm the one you want to allow to control your muscles. Right? That probably is not a good, efficient use of neural real estate. Right? So what probably happens, this is nice for us because it's nice and intuitive and it feels good. But thinking about thinking is misleading. Probably not what's going on in your brain. There is actually in neuroscience research a lot of controversy. In the extreme, that's probably not the case. But there might be neurons in which they're maximally stimulated when you're only leaving Kalkin 04. So there is some specialization, but not to the extreme of dedicating different neural circuits to every single little thing you know how to do. So. The investigators in this paper argued, they said, listen, this is not going to scale well. Works great for 3, 30, 3 million, but not 3 billion motor primitives. So let's do something slightly different. And they're going to create a neural network that looks very much like uh, an orchestra. We're going to have fast units, which is the orchestra. And then we're going to have some slow units or some slow neurons, which is the conductor. And the conductor is going to push the fast neurons into patterns of activation that produce shaking the block up and down, or the conductor does something different and pushes the neural networks, uh, the fast units, into shaking the block left and right. This is nice because now we can train the fast units to learn more and more melodies. They can learn more and more motor primitives, and we can train the conductor in how to push the fast units into the right melody at the given point in time. So again, we're just at the metaphor level now. Which neuron here is receiving the goal? The orchestra or the conductor? conductor? The conductor, right? So we have these slow units. Slow units, which you can see now in the top right, one of those slow neurons is receiving the goal influences the slow behavior of the slow units and the change in behavior of the slow, neur uh, slow units or neurons are going to push the fast ones and ultimately the input-output neurons into the right motor primitive. 
What do we mean by fast and slow? Well, remember our tau constant, the Eeyore and the Woody Allen neurons. So in this experiment, the investigators said, OK, evolution, you can evolve weights, gains, and thetas, but you cannot evolve tau. We're going to set tau for you. They took, they connected everything up, <clears throat> but they set uh, the tau for some of the neurons to be 5 and for the other 70. These seem like arbitrary numbers, so they probably tuned them a little bit to get this whole thing to work. Yep? Do you know what they were for the input-output unit? I think they're the same. You have to go back and read the paper, but these are also fast, and I think they're, they're changing at the same time, temporal time scale as these. So for our purposes, input-output and fast Actually, you can just sort of think of them as all one mass for our purposes. Okay. So did it work? Of course it worked. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a paper. So let's, um, let's start at the top left here. So what's plotted in the top left panel is the value of the neurons um, that are being taught, are pro uh, uh, proprioceptive information, and they're being taught this. So I'm sorry, this was a detail I forgot to mention. The investigators did not only provide the goal, they literally held the hands of the robots and said, when you hear this goal, I want you to do this. So they were actually demonstrating to the robot what it was supposed to do. So the robot could feel that because its arms were being moved. It wasn't actuating its joints. It could feel it, and it could feel it through its proprioceptive sensors and also through its visual sensor. So the robot has some cameras, and it's looking at the block in its own, its own hands. So the investigator is basically saying this is what it feels like to succeed at goal, whatever value they were feeding into the goal neuron. So that's what the robot felt in its proprioceptive sensors. And proprioceptive give information about joint angles. So this would be 0, this would be a positive proprioceptive value, this would be a negative proprioceptive value. Right? So you can see the investigator holding the robot's hands and pulling the robot's hands up and down three times, UD times three, and pulling its hands left and right three times, LR times three, and then pulling the robot's hands back to the home position. So they're feeling it. Eventually, the robot, through evolution, is able to do it on its own. So this picture, the investigator is not touching the robot and does it on its own when it hears this goal signal. And if you visually compare this picture to the teaching signal, it's pretty close. So the robot is learning to do the task. Same thing with the robot um, seeing its own hands in the block while the investigators are teaching it, and then seeing its own hands and its block when it's and the block when it's doing it on its own. Okay. This is vision, but this doesn't look like a pixel array. Remember that this is the value of one of the neurons connected to the camera. So it's getting information from the camera. We won't go into how that transformation is done. It's not important for our purposes. So the robot feels and sees what it's supposed to do as it's being taught that uh, goal. And then it feels and sees the same thing when it does it on its own. It's learned to do it. Same thing on the right. The right column represents a completely different goal. Start at the home position, reach for the object, shake it back and forth three times, and then go back to the home position. Two different goals. OK, let's come down here now. And if you look carefully, you will see uh, 160, uh, sorry, 10, is that right? That looks, yeah, that's right. From 101 to 160, these are the fast context neurons. So 101 to 160, fast context. So if I go back here, that's this middle bowl of spaghetti. These are the fast hidden neurons. They're not connected directly to sensors and motors. So what's being plotted down here are the values of the hidden neurons. These are the neurons that have no direct contact with the outside, uh, outside world. Um, we have each row in this picture corresponds to one of these 60 hidden neurons. White represents a uh, negative value, one, uh, a value near minus one, and a black value indicates a value close to plus one. What can you see in this picture? Let's see. 
three bumps, like or three uh, white spaces, kind of like the sine waves. You can see that there are three oscillations in the whole mass of hidden neurons while the robot is doing this, right? So the hidden neurons are sort of in the background saying up, down, up, down, up, down. They're telling the input and output neurons exactly what to do. You can actually see it. And then they also oscillate in a different pattern three times. That's the hidden neurons in the background saying left, right, left, right, left, right. So you can see them telling the input output neurons exactly what to do. This is the orchestra. Remember, these are changing very quickly, right? If you look along any one row, you can see black suddenly turn to white, or white suddenly turn to black. These neurons can change their value very quickly. They're Woody <coughs> Allen neurons. They're able to respond quickly to influence. Let's go further back into the neural network, all the way to the, the right-hand side, where we have our slow contact neurons that are uh, changing slowly and also receiving the goal. So what's happening here? We have neurons 161 through 180. So we have 20 of these uh, slow neurons. What are they doing? The pattern is split in the middle. You can see the pattern changes here, right? So these neurons change slowly. And in this period, at least, they look like they're almost constant. They're not changing. These are changing three times. These aren't. So what, is, what are the 20 conductors saying? Saying during this period? Generally up and down, and then they cancel generally left and right. They're saying up and down, but they're saying something more than just up and down. Up and down what? Continue. Continue what you're doing. Continue what you're doing, right? Keep doing, keep doing up and down until I say stop. Right? As a conductor does. Okay. So the conductor does it, the slow neurons do it for a while. They're slow, but they can change. So de depending on how what was evolved in there, eventually the conductors, so they're not waving the baton, they're holding it here, they slowly change to down here. And now what are they saying? Now they're saying left and right. And you can see they're also oscillating a little bit, so they don't necessarily need to be constant. But whatever they're saying, they're doing at a slower pace, right? OK. So we can see how this additional mathematics that we built up for CTRNNs has a purpose. It makes it easier for us to produce robots that do difficult things. And one of those difficult things is being able to break up tasks into simpler motor primitives, simpler actions, and then figure out how to mix and match them, right? We'd, we would like our robot not to memorize how to leave Culkin 4 and then can never find its way out of Culkin 3, right? It should learn that the task of leaving a classroom is made up of three parts. Get up, pack your bags, get to the door. But the way in which that's done is slightly different in different uh, situations, and you can also mix and match, right? We don't want it to mix and match by trying to create a larger and larger neural network that specializes to all these different things and then cannot generalize, can't do this. We want to try and get our fast neurons to digest or learn more and more of these motor primitives at the same time that the slower neurons are learning how to push out the right sequence of motor primitives given the overall goal. Yes? So is this neural network capable of having, say, the slow units uh, give both the up, down, and left, right command at the same time? Good question, right? So what would happen if we gave, remember the goal is just a single number, but what would happen if we gave a number between, between these goals, right? Would it actually do something that's halfway in between? I don't know, and they didn't tell us in the paper. That would be a great final, final project idea. Okay, I think with that we'll leave, uh, leave things here. You have a quiz due tonight. Um, have a good weekend. Thank you.